This is a love story. Please try to remember that as you read this, love. It's really about Julie. I knew from the moment I set eyes on her that I'd do anything to have her. Fortunately though, I didn't have to work very hard. I could see it in her eyes the first time I talked to her and asked her out. She wanted me to and she said yes before I even finished asking. Her eyes sparkle like diamonds, it's one of my favorite things about her. We were quick to say I love you, only a few dates in, but we were sure. My place is full of my idiot friends and we've started talking about getting a place of our own. My best friend, Greg, doesn't get along the best with her and isn't very happy about me moving out but he understands. We all hang out together sometimes, see movies, bowl, normal stuff like that. Well, I got a call a couple nights ago from Julie's parents, who live out of state. They said they got a call from the police and that Julie had been in a car accident. Drunk driver crossed the center line, what a cliche right? Anyway, I was panicked out of my mind speeding like crazy to the hospital when Julie called me on my cell. I could hardly believe my eyes when I saw her name on the called ID. I answered the phone not quite letting myself get my hopes up just yet. After all, it could have been someone calling me from her phone. Relief washed over me like rain when I heard her voice, baby? I'm okay, it wasn't that bad, just some bumps and bruises. The airbags and seatbelt did all the work, are you okay? I don't mind admitting, I pulled over and cried for a long time. She said she was checking out of the hospital shortly and I could pick her up there. When I got to the hospital I had myself pretty well composed. I walked in and was just making my way to the help desk when I heard her call my name. I turned around and saw her, the sparkle was out of her eyes, which wasn't that surprising, I thought, considering what had happened, but otherwise seemingly none the worse for the wear. I completely lost what composure I thought I had. I broke down again and we held each other and she slid her hand onto the back of my neck and into my hair like she does when I'm upset, and after a minute or two we made our way to my car. Julie told me the drunk driver had been killed, and I thought good, better him than Julie and I'm not the least bit ashamed of it. I would have killed him myself if I could have. But she was okay and that was all I cared about then. When we got back to my place no one was home and the house was dark, which was odd since there was almost always someone home and those idiot roommates of mine always forget to kill the lights when they leave. Julie was feeling a little chilly and she looked a little pale so we cuddled up under some blankets and fell asleep almost immediately. It had been a trying day after all. I remember the last thing she said to me as we were falling asleep, I'll love you forever, baby. I called into work the next day to stay home with Julie, she was feeling pretty stiff, again not surprising. I had some missed calls from family and friends, no doubt they'd heard what happened and were checking in. I'd get back to them later. Maybe it was just the accident, or that I hadn't seen Julie without makeup in ever, but she didn't look very good, I mean her color was off and her eyes looked slightly hollow. And the sparkle still wasn't there. I suggested taking her back to the hospital, but she insisted she was fine, just tired and sore. Well, a couple more days went by and I told work I was staying home with Julie until she was feeling better. But she wasn't getting better. Her eyes were the worst of it. More hollow all the time, and her skin was downright cold to the touch. It was getting to the point where I was going to bring her back to the hospital, whether she wanted to go or not, and that was when I got the phone call. It was Julie's mom. She had been crying and was clearly making an effort to stay composed. Julie's service was to be held the day after tomorrow, she said. I asked her what she was talking about, service for what? I was confused. Julie walked up to me as I stood there on the phone. She was looking right into my eyes when her mom said I know this is hard for you, it's hard for all of us, but Julie's gone and we can't bring her back, we all loved her but she's gone. I still didn't understand until I saw the look of horror in Julie's eyes. She knew, this whole time she knew. She didn't survive the accident yet somehow she was here and suddenly I understood. Her eyes, hollow and sunken, the sparkle gone. Her skin, cold and discolored. She was dead and I was watching her slowly decay. 
My stomach dropped and I felt myself fall. Julie caught me, and I felt her cold hands and felt the coldness for what it was, death. I heard her mom on the phone, a tiny voice calling my name over and over. I picked up the phone and told her I was listening, Julie silent the whole time. Her mom repeated that the service was the day after tomorrow and her body would be cremated at noon the next day. Numbly, I told her okay, thanked her, and told her I'd see her then. I hung up the phone and Julie and I just stared at each other for a long time. There was no doubt now, I was looking at someone who was not alive. Eventually I said one word, how? She said she didn't know, and she didn't care. And you know what? Neither did I. She came with me to the service, and it wasn't like what happens in the movies, where people walk through her like she's not there or anything like that. They couldn't see her, that much was obvious, but somehow no one bumped into her, and when they made space for me, it seemed they made space for her too, although they didn't seem to know they were doing it. When I talked to her parents she was with me, silent but strong, for me. When I viewed her body she was with me. Her hand, cold now, so cold, finding that spot on my neck. She looked exactly as she always had, beautiful, healthy. But I knew it was makeup and artificial. Underneath she would look exactly like the Julie that had her cold hand on my neck. It was a hard thing, looking down at her, but she was so supportive and I knew this was why I loved her and couldn't be without her. We left and went back to my place. My roommates were home but stayed out of our way as we went to my room. That night we didn't sleep, we just held each other and I didn't care at all how cold she was. We cried and talked. Laughed at the funny memories and cried more. We didn't talk about what was happening or what was going to happen. As darkness began to lose the battle and light filled the sky, a horrifying thought occurred to me, and somehow I knew it would be true. I was seeing Julie as she was. I mean, literally seeing her as her body was. And she was set to be cremated at noon. Do you understand? She was to be burned until nothing would be left but ash and I would have to watch it happen. I was on the phone immediately to her parents, to the funeral home, to her church. No one would listen. They all thought it was grief. I felt rage and despair building inside me and was about to completely break down when I felt her hand on my neck, in that spot, and she turned my head so I was looking into her eyes, now very hollow and turning grotesque. She told me it was okay, it was okay. She told me she would love me forever and I knew in that moment what I was going to do. Those last few hours we watched the sun come up and what became a beautiful day. We watched clouds turn into funny shapes. As noon approached I made an excuse to go to my closet and then we waited. When noon hit we were both crying again, but nothing happened. We were just starting to wonder what that meant when I saw the look in her eyes, just as before, she knew. She felt it before I saw it. She told me it didn't hurt, it doesn't hurt baby. She began to smoke and her hair caught on fire. A cold calm set over me and I took her tight into my arms. The flames began to burn me too. She tried to push me away, to protect me. She fought my hold but her strength was fading. I could feel the flames now burning into me but I didn't care, I wouldn't let her go through this alone and I didn't need to live much longer anyway. We didn't scream, we just sat there together and burned. Her hair was gone and her face and skin turned black and I held her tighter and to my chest. I told her I'd love her forever and that I'd see her soon. I held her until she was ash in my arms and she fell through my fingers. I reached for what I had taken out of the closet, and suddenly she was gone, not a trace of her left. No ash remained anywhere, nothing was burned, even my own burns were gone. Was it grief? Did I imagine the whole thing? Was she ever here? I don't know. But I wrote this so my family and friends know why I had to do this. I won't stay here without her. I can't. I'll find her somehow and the sparkle will be in her eyes again and everything will be okay and like it was. I'm sorry about this mom, dad. 
But I hope you understand. I'm going now, I hope I don't get blood on this. I don't remember much about my childhood, like most people. Those memories are always vague and eventually you realize whatever you remember is probably just a reconstructed memory. You don't have much choice in the matter, and are usually convinced that your memory would never fail you. The first memory I have was when I was five. I'm not sure if it's real or not, but that's when I think I met Michael. I never had any friends, so I was glad when I met him. He called me Jack, and I liked it. As uncertain I am if I remember our first encounter, there is no doubting the strong bond we immediately formed. I won't bore you with the details of what we did every day for the past few years, but I will outline some of the things we did together, to assure even the most skeptical among the readers of our friendship. Michael, being a slightly effeminate child, didn't have many friends at school either. He was bullied, and the highlight of his day was coming home and sharing a cup of tea with me, all the while telling me of his woes and lessening his burden. The tea, unlike my words of consolation, was make-believe. Another one of his favorite activities was cutting my hair. He would style it in all sorts of ways, and I enjoyed each one of them. Fortunately for him, my hair grew inexplicably fast and he often got a chance to restyle it. There was one thing that constantly strained out relationship, though. Don't get me wrong, Michael and I had absolutely no hard feeling towards each other. It was his parents. I don't think they approved of me, and I couldn't tell you why even if I tried. It wasn't just disapproval, I began to think they hated me. The longer our friendship lasted, the worse it got. It pains me to even think about it, so I won't dwell on this for long. As quickly as our relationship had initially flourished, it began to diminish after two years. Michael grew to become a stocky football player, and I remained exactly the same as before, scrawny and completely incapable of competing athletically. He made new friends and started to ignore me. This hurt me a lot, especially since I was there for him in his time of need. His abandoning me was the last thing I expected and it hit me hard. I felt like I had no one left in the world. As I sit in the corner of the room and write this, I can see Michael and his friends watching TV. Sometimes it seems like he notices me and looks my way, but I know better. I have now resigned to my fate, he created me, but forgot to destroy me. Have you ever played one word story? It's a very simple game, a few people take turns, going around to make a sentence. Each person adds one word, until the sentence is complete, then someone says period, and it's read back. It's actually pretty fun if you play with the right people, but I'm pretty antisocial and only have one or two friends. They don't like the game as much as I do, so I use a random chat site to play with strangers. It's completely anonymous, so my identity is supposed to be safe. Anyway, it was late afternoon on a Saturday, and I was in the middle of a game when my apartment went dark. It was probably caused by the weird heat, all week, other tenants in my building had complained about the power cutting short around this. It only lasted a few minutes, but when the power came back on, I saw I had been disconnected from the site. When I tried to re-enter, I couldn't, it kept crashing or something and I kept getting disconnected. I'm easily bored, and was a little more than pissed that I hadn't finished my game. So, I took to Google, and searched chat room, anonymous, one word story. After 0.18223 seconds, I had 23,000 results. I scrolled down the page and tried a few sites out, but either the players weren't very good, or I was led to an anonymous sex chat site. It wasn't until the third page of results that I found something interesting, microfiction. Calm. I clicked the heading and entered the site, then I logged in as a guest. I was really surprised to see how dedicated this site was to an overall simple game, mystery, parody, anime, music, cartoons, horror, film, superstition, and superhero were just a few of the categories that people could use to play one word story. For no particular reason, I went to mystery first and played a few short games, then I went to horror, then to music, and to a few others. 
Eventually, I went to take a bathroom break and made sure to bookmark the site so I could visit it in the future. The site was pretty well managed under each main heading, for example, horror, there were subheadings. These were games being hosted by members. Some games only had a few people in them, others had 30 or 40. Some were open to anyone, others were private games that you could only get into if you had a password that the host had sent you. I played for a few hours, really enjoying myself because everyone here took the game just seriously enough to make each sentence interesting, and also had enough fun to make the whole story funny to read out loud, while still making sense. It was 10 now, and 10.30 was my self-imposed bedtime, so I resigned to play one more game before going to sleep. Going to Mystery for the last time that night, I found a private game. Being a guest on the site, I couldn't message the person to ask to join, and I would've kept looking for a public game, except that the page froze. I refreshed it, and saw that the game had been changed to public, with room for one person. I thought about that, a one-on-one -on -one game of one-word story, and I felt excited at the possibility that this guy would be just as good as I was, and we could create something really unique. So, I joined. The host, username doppelganger1221, went first, I, appeared on the screen almost instantly. I was impressed with this guy's bravery, as using I in this game usually led to embarrassing sentences in the long run. So, I rewarded him with a simple enough word that would keep the sentence going, C. He responded almost immediately with you. This was honestly a very amateur tactic. It would make the game harder to finish, and the unsettling approach was never enough to make me quit. I decided to humor him though, and typed, through. His response, your. I thought about where the sentence was going, and noticed that my living room window was still open from the afternoon, I typed window. His response was a period, signaling the end of the sentence. I see you through your window. I chuckled to myself, realizing this guy was a creep, a player who tries to make unsettling or disturbing sentences to scare his opponents into leaving the game. He probably had a friend with him, and they were thinking up ways to scare me. I didn't blame them, my sister and I did that last Halloween when I babysat for my parents. I started the next sentence, you. His reply, R. My reply, not. His reply, safe. My reply was a period, ending the sentence. You are not safe. Again, I chuckled, and watched as he started the next sentence. I appeared on the screen. I typed am, which was followed by coming. I thought about ending the sentence there, as a slight punishment against the guy for not taking the game seriously. Instead, I typed for to see if he would type what I thought he would. He typed you. I was right on the money, and typed a period. I am coming for you. It wasn't funny anymore, just boring. There was a chat, so I used it to tell the guy to cut the creep stuff. I told him it wasn't funny, and if he didn't cut it out, I would leave the game. He actually replied. Look out your window. That caught me off guard, but I did what I was told. Across the street, a light post had burned out its bulb, which I hadn't noticed before. It was pretty dark, and I couldn't really make out any shapes. I turned back to the monitor. Doppelganger had typed I, and I saw in the chat that he had posted another comment. Basically, he was telling me what to write. I was becoming fed up with him, but 10.30 was just 5 minutes away, so I reasoned to just finish, and did as he asked. I typed have. He typed a. I typed gun. He typed two. I typed your. He typed head. I finished the sentence with a period. I have a gun to your head. I sighed aloud and closed my eyes, stretching at my desk. I just wanted this game to be over. It was my turn, and he had sent me another list of words, so I typed I. He typed am. I typed at. He typed your. I typed window. He typed a period. I am at your window. Reading it aloud, I realized the game was over, 
we had made the story relate to our first sentence. Out of habit, I read every sentence out loud. I see you through your window. You are not safe. I am coming for you. I have a gun to your head. I am at your window. I finished reading and rested my head against my chair, yawning. I was drowsy and thought about sleeping in my chair when a loud, cracking sound echoed across the empty street outside and I noticed the crack that was spider webbing from the center of my computer monitor. I blinked to full alertness and saw it, the glint of a bullet, sticking out of my screen. I turned my head behind me and screamed as I saw someone in a mask staring in through my window. Out of panic, I dashed out of my chair and into my bedroom. I hid in the closet, under a thick pile of dirty laundry, and waited, trying to control my rapid breathing as my eyes adjusted to the uncomfortable darkness. It was a few minutes before I heard soft footsteps. The maniac was in my bedroom, I could see his dark boots and leather pants. He fired the gun again at my bed sheets. He must have thought I was hiding in the covers. He rummaged through my drawers and took something that I thought was money or my prescription medicine. I saw him stalk towards my bathroom and fire a shot into the shower. He looked around in there before turning around and looking under my bed. He was almost level with the floor so I could see his features, he was at least six feet and dressed in all black except for his mask, which was white with red tear tracks under the eyes and a painted set of crooked, beast-like teeth, he seemed to see perfectly in the dark. I could really only see him because his clothes seemed to be darker than the already lightless interior of my bedroom. After what felt like hours, he stood up and walked out of my room. I stayed in my closet all night, eventually falling asleep, covered in my unclean socks and underwear. I smelled horrible in the morning, and the first thing I did was take a shower. As I did, I stepped on the bullet that had torn a hole in my shower curtains. Afterwards, I called the police, who told me to come down to the station. I got ready to go, but couldn't find my keys anywhere. While looking through the drawers of my desk, I complained internally about my monitor being busted. I could still see the site, the chat room, and the game, and took a picture of it with my phone for the police. Now, in the kitchen looking for my keys, it hit me that I had kept them in my dresser drawer and ran into my room to see that what the psycho had taken was my keys. I groaned and was about to call my buddy for a ride when I accidentally opened my photo gallery. I was very annoyed with myself until I took another look at the picture I had taken. Something was different in the picture than I had remembered from last night. There was a new line in the chat. A single word. A simple question. A word I had used so many times over the words, after a game was over. I never thought that this word would send shivers down more spine nor turn my blood to ice in my veins. Heather was at her friend Jenny's house one afternoon. It was just after school and Jenny's parents hadn't arrived home from work yet. It was just the two of them, and they were engrossed in a board game. Heather was having a good time, except they were playing in a room adjacent to Jenny's parents' bedroom, and every now and then Heather would glance up through the open door of that bedroom to see a little girl doll sitting up on the bed. Its eyes appeared to be staring at them. She tried to ignore it, but over time it started to get to her. I'm sorry, she said. But I can't concentrate. That doll on the bed over there is giving me the creeps. Oh, no problem. Jenny replied. She went to the room and closed to the door to calm Heather down. Then the two friends resumed their game. It hadn't been long, however, before Heather glanced up again. The door was open once again, and again the doll appeared to be staring at them. Jenny couldn't understand it. She could swear that there was nobody else home and that there was no way the door could have opened without the knob being turned. Shrugging, she went up to the bedroom and closed the door, this time making sure that it clicked shut. But again and again, they would check the door and find it wide open. Heather was starting to get very scared. Finally, Jenny had enough of this. She went into the bedroom, grabbed the doll and threw it into the closet, slamming it shut. 
She then slammed the bedroom door shut behind her, and they resumed their game. For a while, things appeared to be going well. But then Heather glanced up one last time. All of a sudden she stood up and said, goodbye, and ran home as fast as she could. This time when Jenny looked up, she saw the bedroom door only slightly ajar, with a chair propped up behind it. And sitting on the chair, peeking through the opening at them, was the doll.